All right, well, I'm going to say let's get started. Our attendance has doubled in the last two minutes, so that's a good thing. Um, so welcome here, everybody. We are here today with uh, Pastor Kent and his wife, Pam, and we're going to be get, uh, going on our second week of parenting talks that they have planned for us. So today's session they've titled Being a Dazzling Parent in a Frazzling World, uh, in a Frazzling World, um, and Kent has assured me that they don't, in fact, have a silver bullet up their sleeves here, but um, we'll hear from them shortly, I'm sure. So that's obviously a nice creative title, and I want to ask you, Kent, did you have a marketing team help you come up with that, or where's, where'd that title come from? Well, it's funny that you say that, because actually I did have a team, and the team was me and my daughter, Kelsey. We, we wrote these out, and um, I don't know if you've ever written a description for anything, like we write a little paragraph, and you read it, and it sounds just like totally accurate but totally boring and so we we went back and forth and actually it goes back to uh kelsey's you know she has some papers or things or she had a speech to do a little humble brag she was the valedictorian at the srss so she had this big speech she had to write in the spring so then i was able to edit and so we're learning in our relationship to how do we make it better so she sat down with me for a while and we kind of just hacked away at the the wording to make it sound less lame and so now I think we overpromised, made it sound like it's going to be this amazing thing, which we're like, okay, we were just working on it to try to make it more. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, creative title naming aside, um, uh, we also all know that you are a um, doodler and that you like to provide awesome visuals during your sermons. Um, and you also take notes, I understand, in a very similar fashion. And so I've been curious where, where that's come from. Is there some context there? Is there a story behind how you began that or began saying, thinking that was a good way to process ideas or what's your story there? Well, drawing, I just always feel like I was doing that from going way back. I always liked making posters at school. Like any art related projects was really fun for me. I never really become a fine artist though. I'm more of a cartoony doodler, kind of fill in the mar margins of my paper all the time. I was always, <laughs> I think that drawing actually helped me focus on what was the, the teacher was saying, or even in meetings now as a grown up, I, I still often doodle and write to help me stay focused. Mm. Um, a big thing was this was a cartoon I had, a cartoon book called, actually, it was called Cartoons, and it was all about how to draw cars. So actually, okay. I started drawing cars when I was a young teen. And then more recently, I think since having the iPad, I try to get notes. I, if I listen to a talk or I try to get it all on one page so I can remember the key things and like I like drawing and doodling along with it so cool um yeah just a reminder for those listening that we are recording all of these sessions and putting them up on the church website so if you missed last week's session or uh or if you miss a, a coming session uh, next week you can go back and watch it on the website um I'm gonna ask uh Kent and Pam to give a quick one to two minute recap of what they talked about last week um, might be a little bit of a sales pitch as well to convince you to go back and watch last week's session. Um, but before I turn it over to them, I'm just going to give you guys all a quick reminder of the Q&A uh, feature that should be at the bottom of your screen, I believe. If at any time you have a question uh, that comes to your mind while Kent and Pam are talking, um, just pop it on the Q&A button there and we'll have some time towards the end of the talk to address uh, any questions that may come up. So um, yeah, Kent and Pam, I'll, I'll turn it over to you guys. I'm looking forward to what you have to say. All right. Thanks a lot, Kyle. I really appreciate your hosting and kind of producing the show. And um, yeah, we just think it's a great idea that this team has been working so hard to get these uh, May sessions going. Um, there's that leadership track that's been happening on Tuesdays. Pastor Brendan's done a couple of great talks and the Thursdays are kind of hot topics or interesting items. And uh, last week in our session on Wednesday, we did a bit of a Bible overview about what does the Bible say about um, parenting. And there's not a lot of great examples in the Bible of parenting. But what we did last week was we just went through some key scriptures that do talk about the, the Bible or what the Bible says about, um, about parenting. And so the idea is to unignore the Bible. So a lot of the things we have heard before, but it's just this idea of putting into practice these things that are important. And I'd say the key verse for me has been um, this Deuteronomy 6 where it talks about um, just uh, that the Lord our God is one God and to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your strength and then this is given to the parents that they would do this and then they'd be able to pass it on to their children 
So anyway, there's, um, I'd encourage you to go back and watch it if you're interested in parenting, especially the Bible kind of background of it, uh, to introduce it. Uh, today's session, uh, we're going to actually do, uh, I'm going to share one scripture with you guys, but we're going to focus most of our time tonight on sort of some principles and maybe practices of parenting. You know, there's just not a, not a lot of Bible verses that talk about how to get peanut butter off the doorknob handle or how to, you know, get your kids to kind of eat their vegetables or whatever, that sort of thing. So we don't have all the answers, but we want to share some principles with you tonight that we found helpful when our kids were younger and even now as they've moved into teenage and young adulthood. Um, so we'll, we'll share some of those principles, but this session will be really great and most helpful for you if you would actually do what Kyle had asked you to do and just type in some of the things that you found most helpful. And it could be ideas or tips or trip, uh, just kind of things that you found helpful. So I'd encourage you to do that. The Bible verse that I'm going to read and then I'll turn it over to Pam um, in just a minute here is Ephesians chapter 5. And it's not really talking about parenting, but what I love about this verse is it uh, talks about living differently because we're followers of Jesus as we imitate God. And then it says, in, uh, Ephesians 5, 15, it says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. And, uh, and it goes on and says more things about being controlled by the Holy Spirit rather than other things. But I, I love the idea of just about what's the wise thing to do. And so some of these things aren't, we're not going to try to bend your arm and make you do them or say that the Bible tells you you have to do it this way. This is really more just our best, some of, some of the things that we found helpful, maybe that way. And we'd love for you to say that too. You don't have, and we haven't mastered all these things. These are more just things that we tried to do. And so we hope it's helpful for you, but we want to offer it with humility and just telling you that these are some things we hope could be helpful for you to think about or some categories. And the first thing that we're going to do is have Pam talk about uh, kind of some principles that, um, yeah, so the, of, of parenting and just some kind of some practical, I'd say, principles. And she'll go through this acrostic with us. And so go ahead, Pam, and take it away. Okay, quick tip. Bubble gum in the hair comes out with canola oil, just so you know. And then you have to shampoo after that. Um, the word I want to talk about, or at least use acrostic for, is engage. And um, engage defined is occupy, attract, or involve in someone's interest or attention, or to participate or become involved in. Basically, it's an intentional thing to engage in a relationship. So what are some ways we can engage as a parent? I'm going to start with E, and uh, the word there is eyes. And I think... Um, this is probably something we didn't learn right away when we were first parents, but we sort of learned over time. And I think this might have come out of Ezo, actually. We, used, we watched a parenting series from uh, Ezo and his wife, and um, we got some good tips from them. But I think this might have been one of theirs. Um, get their eyes, get your child's eyes, and give, you, give them your eyes. So get their eyes, give your eyes. Um, as a small child, you might say, hey, look at mommy and then get their eyes before you make that intentional um, thing that you want to tell them or thing that you're asking them to do. And often a kid will be playing or they'll be doing something else and then they'll say, yeah, mommy, and then they're still playing and doing. And then you might just want to stop and say, okay, just look at mommy and then make sure that you have that connection before you give it a, an expectation or some rule or cleaning up or whatever it is. Um, and then especially when a child, and actually a teenager or adult, when they're holding a device of any kind and they're looking down, wait until you have their eyes. And I know sometimes that can be uncomfortable. I do this, I've done this with adults who uh, are down texting and then you say, you kind of just say, and then they'll go, yeah, yeah, I can do both. And then they keep looking down and, and you, somehow you don't feel like they can actually do both. So I just wait and then they'll go, no, go ahead. I, I can do both. And then I will say, no, no, it's okay. I'll just wait. And then finally they'll just, pause and give me their eyes. And then I feel like I have a connection with them. So I think it is important to have eyes in communication, whether it's with your small children, your grown up children, adults, whoever it is. Um, I think that's important. And then I think it's also important to give your eyes. And I think that's a gift we give each other in relationships. And I think it's important for our kids to see that. And I know I was guilty um, when my kids were little, sometimes they'd come home from school and they would just be blabbing and talking and I would be either busy in the kitchen or I might be on the computer doing something that I needed to do, some sort of organizational something, something for I was something I was volunteering for. And, and then I realized that my child was talking to me and I, was, I wasn't ignoring because I thought I could still hear them, 
and engage, but realized I wasn't fully engaging. And so I reminded myself of to stop being on the computer and listen. And as soon as you give your eyes to somebody and you look and listen, it's just such a gift that you give them that they feel like you're attentive, that you're fully um, engaged with them. And I think that's important too. Um, Kent, any word on that one? Well, it was interesting, Pam, as you talked there, some great points and reminders there. I just remember when our kids were babies, I didn't even think of it before the session, but right when you were talking, that was one of the most amazing things as a new dad for me was just so that I moved and then I'd see this baby laying on the blanket. They couldn't do anything. They're just like pooping in their pants and just crying and nothing. But then they had this, mm, I thought I was moving, they, were, they would walk. And then when I, I started realizing, oh my goodness, this kid is tracking me. And so like that, like right from birth and, and kind of early on, once they're able to kind of track with you a little bit, I think that principle of having their eyes as you try to talk, that's good. And I'll just say, I'm one of the adults, I'm one of the adults she does that to sometimes <laughs> until she has my eyes and then we talk. So it's a good marriage principle as well. So. <laughs> Um, just with the baby thing, and also they, they track with your eyes, but as soon as you actually give them your attention, then all of a sudden they'll smile or giggle or they'll realize that they're getting it back somehow. It's, it is, you're right, it's interesting, even from being small babies, that they interact and they just have a sense of it already. Um, N in engage is nearness. Some people say they're not really affectionate, they're not really huggy people, they don't really, you know, they just don't do the little touchy feely thing. I just say, become a huggy person. I just think that physical nearness with your kids is so important. And I think that, um, especially now during COVID, we're kind of encouraged to not be near people. And we're supposed to give people two meters. And I'm kind of curious to know in post COVID era, if we're actually going to be distanced from people um, emotionally, and because of, of being forced to have the distance now, but I think we're okay in our families and in our own homes to still be very affectionate with our own children. And I think that affection screams connection. I think it's a closeness, there's care, there's trust. It's hard to hug somebody when you're really mad at them or really frustrated or really disappointed. So I think bringing it in and hugging it out can actually just remind you that you are connected. And I think that being uh, physical that in that way is, is important. Um, it shows that you wanna be engaged, that you're interested in them. Um, I know yelling up and down the stairs, like when you have distancing, it just doesn't work very good. So if you're at the, if your kid's in the basement, you're at the top of the stairs and you go, how was your day? And then your kid yells back up, I fell, scraped my knee, and someone called me stupid. And then you yell back down, oh, that's too bad. Let me know if you need a Band-Aid. And you can just, tell, from that distancing, you just know that's not going to, he's not going to feel any sense of warmth or care at all in what he just said to you about uh, being hurt and uh, being called a name. So I think that the nearness, being in the, in the person's space is important. Um, and I don't think we can expect to have really close relationships, especially with our kids, if we think that we can just do it with our heart, our spirit, and our minds. I think there is a physical component to that parent-child relationship that is just really key. And I think it's, it's up to us to instigate that uh, nearness. Kent, what, any word? Yeah, and I just know, just acknowledge that sometimes it's hard to be close to your kids. You just want space or you need a break. And, and we're not saying you have to be with them all the time, but it's just that wanting to be close to them and that how much that benefits um, the relationship that you're building with them. And so I think it's good to, to work, on, work on it. And I know just just talking about, since we're in these restricted times with C19, like I was in a meeting today and it was just so great to, you know, we had social distancing, but it was just really great to meet in real life and that, that actual interaction. So here we are on a Zoom call talking about how great it is to speak in, in real life. And I think everybody on the call would, you know, realize how great it would be if we were sitting kind of in a living room or in a room in the church and able just to talk and interact and, you know, talk more person to person. I think it's the same with our parenting, just to try to be in the same close environment with them. Uh, I think it, it kind of helps include them. And so, yeah, great point. Okay. Engage. Uh, the first G in engage um, is guide. And this is basically just setting up rules and expectations for your kids, for their behavior, not just at home, but for the behavior anywhere you are, whether you're at church, whether you're out in the grocery store, whether you're at the park. They're just rules and expectations that you have of your kids 
um, that you set up that you that helps to guide them. And I think it's important to remember that kids need boundaries and that having boundaries gives them a sense of security because they know someone is going to correct them if they're going wrong. And I think it's important that our kids um, have that sense that we are going to be involved and that we will help nudge and guide and, and protect them in that way. Um, I think one way to, to get them to understand or to engage with a expectation or rule is to have them repeat it once, to, once in a while. So if you might say, what does mommy say when you get too loud? And then hopefully your kid will say, oh, use your inside voice, and then they'll tone their voice down. So I think it's important to try to get them to also repeat some of the expectations so that they grasp it even at their own level. Um, something that lots of kids do is nagging or whining. And I think sometimes as parents, it was just, it was just easier to give them what they were whining for than to just let them keep whining. So I think if you can, if you have the patience to do this, um, try not to respond to the whining and try to get them to um, speak in a nice, natural, pleasing voice when they want to ask you something. So if, uh, if they are just whining and whining and you go, oh, what was that? What did you say? Did you say something to me? And sometimes they'll click in and go, oh, yeah, I have to use my other voice. Or you might just say, try again, and then get them to figure out that that, that whining voice isn't going to get them what they want and that they need to just say please and, and ask it in a, in a normal voice. Um, I think it's important to guide conversations. It's important to ask good opening questions. And I know this is, it's really hard to do this because it's so easy when the kids come in the door and go, hey, how was your day? And they go, good, and then it's done. And it's just, it's hard to think of good questions to ask so that they actually have to say something about their day. And so if you can figure out what those questions are, I think that's a good way to try to engage in conversations. Um, get them to talk what they're thinking about or what they're worried about. Something we tried to do is called high-low. I think we mentioned that last week. Um, just asking what the best part of the day, what was the worst part or hardest part of the day. And that will often just get them talking about some of the things that happened. Um, and as we guide or nudge and direct them in those conversations, I think that's when we can help filter the morality. We can uh, sort of teach some scripture or faith in Jesus just in having those kind of conversations. I know when we, I think we also went to this last week when we tried to have conversations at mealtimes um, when our boys were definitely into playing video games or playing outside and just they needed to eat and go. Um, and Kelsey, who loved to have the conversations, would quickly grab the conversation starter book that was in with our devotional books, and she would pull that out, and she'd go, oh, let's do it, have a conversation, and the boys would be like, no. But there's things like that. There's lots of tools out there to use that can help sort of start some conversations and sort of get, what, get ideas of what your kids are thinking. Um, I think it's important to use positive reinforcement when you guide and give rules and things, when they actually do something that you appreciate, that you have taught, or you know is a good thing just to remember to encourage them like really love how you encourage your brother or how you spoke to him or anything that you see is it's important to affirm them in that and then when there's constructive adjustments um, then you might say what is something we could have done differently or how could we do it different next time and just help to guide that sort of problem solving thinking for them um, something that i think kent and i tried to do and i guess maybe this is when they were older i guess probably yeah, anyway, something that we would we try to do is to say yes as much as possible. And I think that the more you say yes, the more it's cohesive in the relationship. But then when you do need to say no to something, it has weight. If you say no, 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 you can't do that. No, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. Then when you really need the no to be a no, it doesn't have the same kind of weight. So I think it's important to say yes as much as possible and only use no when you know you have to. And, and I think the kids understand then that when you say no, you really mean it, and it has, it has weight when you say it. Kent? I, I guess I, when I was thinking about guide, I don't know if this is robbing something from later on in your outline, so I'll just say it now, and if it, it's the wrong spot, I'm sorry about that. But something I wish I would have been better at, that actually, Pam, you're better at it than me, would, would be to get the kids to do things along with me so that they would be kind of guided more by by that experience I think I was too quick to just do it for them so I thought of myself being oh I'm this great servant I'll just serve them and do this thing for them but um yeah something I guess I would recommend to you if you're starting out wherever you are with your parenting journey yeah. I, I regret that I'll just tell you I wish I could go back and do a few more things with the kids and now when they're adults like you know we, uh, Kelsey had a couple flat tires uh in the city when she was going to university so I actually Jaden and Kelsey both came and helped and we did it together. So that was a good 
a good thing. But lots of times when they're younger, I, I wish I would have taken them along. And I think guiding by our example, I, I also would say that would not, not be a super big fail, but there's definitely times where I wish I could have guided them better by a better example. And it's only now when our kids are basically adults and they say, oh, mom and dad, you taught us this. And then we're like, oh, man, we, were, we weren't even saying that, but that's what we were doing. So you actually are guiding them by how you actually conduct yourself. So not to freak you out, but it is, it's good to think about like how, how was my example guiding them? Like if they did what I did and they picked it up in the way that I did it and said the things that I say, would that be a good guidance or not? And so I don't know. Yeah. That's yeah. My reaction to that one. And occasionally you would say, do as I say, not as I do. But right. Which is that's not, not a good principle. That's not a good principle. <laughs> but it's honest. <laughs> even if it's super bad <laughs> um the a and engage is an ad adult is the word um i know sometimes when you're talking about being frazzled and you're in this it feels like you're in this conflict with your kid and you're actually arguing and you can't land anywhere and you're both sort of amplifying it and it's getting more intense it was it's funny how often i had to just remind myself that i was the adult in the relationship and I'd be like, okay, just a second. I'm actually an adult that needs to act like an adult in this scenario. So sometimes I would just say, okay, I just need, mommy needs a timeout. And I would pull out of the situation. Sometimes we'd say, okay, you also go have your timeout. Let's calm down. Let's just step away from it. And then we'll come back together and have that conversation. And hopefully the emotion and the intensity is sort of left in your, wherever you had your timeout. And you can come back together and have that conversation. I just, you have to pray for wisdom. I think we prayed for wisdom lots. And the James 1 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. And I think that when we are in a situation with our kids and there is a conflict that you can't seem to resolve, then I think it's okay to too to say, You know what? Let's just pray about this and ask God for wisdom in the situation. And then take the kid and, and pray with them and just say, Hey, Jesus, can you please give us wisdom? to figure out how to work through this problem that we're having. And I think it's important to um, help the kids to see that, that we don't have it all. We don't have all the answers. And sometimes we have, we do have to ask for help. And when, it, when we ask Jesus for help, um, it helps us to sort of settle things down and, and hopefully give wisdom in the situation. Um, I think as health, as healthy adults, it's nice when we can deal with conflict and we can model the same as Kent was saying, we actually model how to do that. Kent, anything else on that one? Uh, I don't know. I'm not much of an adult, so I can't really comment too much on <laughs> That is a true statement. Oh, oh, man. I just wish I could work commenting on being an adult. I don't know. I, can I go back to the other one about guiding? It's sort of about being an adult. And I would just say one more thing. Uh, I would say to parents, one of the amazing things that you can do for your kids is appropriately share your spiritual kind of your testimony but also your current spiritual life with your kids because you can read devotions at the table you can tell them what to do tell them how to act what to wear to church all you can tell them all that but boy if you can share what god's done in your life personally and what your struggles have been in an appropriate way and because they probably know like for them to say hey uh, for me to say hey you know i struggle a little bit with my overeating and i have a struggle with that for me my kids aren't going to go, oh, really? Shock. They're actually going to appreciate that I can be honest with them and say, this is something that I have to work on between me and God. And I think it can be a part of being an adult is just saying that I want to spiritually help my kid. But one of the ways is by, that I guide them is not just by my advice and lectures and having the answers. It's just being willing to, to appropriately share my story and how Jesus meets me and how he helps me and how I'm feeling inadequate and I'm just trying to grow, you know? So I think parent, I think kids really pick up on that and appreciate that part. Okay, the second G is go. And you know, as we're going through these, we have some, we have lots of amazing parents in our church. And so again, these are principles that we have found helpful. You, you might be doing all of these already, um, but if you can get one little nugget, that would be good. Um, but the word go basically means getting involved in your kids' lives any way you can. Um, say the yes as many as many opportunities as you can handle and that you could possibly go to I just think it's really important to get onto where your kids turf I think or their space I think it shows that you value them to take time out of your own schedule out of your own job whatever it is you're doing to go and spend time on their space on their turf 
and I think it's a better understanding of their culture. It, I think it gives you an idea of what they're going through, what they're listening to, what they're hearing, um, what sort of relationships they're observing. And I think it just gives you a better sense of what your kids are going through so that um, you may just be able to better understand them when you have them back home. Um, when they have tests or exams, I think it's good to know that. in here all right sorry about that okay so we were on go and getting involved in our kids lives getting onto their turf and i know sometimes your kids might be a little bit embarrassed but i think for the most part um depending i guess on your relationship with your kids i think that they uh secretly love it and i think that it shows your pride it shows your value in them and i think they take pride in you engaging in their world and in their culture uh, the last letter in engage is E, and uh, basically it's creating a safe place to be, a safe environment. I know we were talking about highs and lows before, when you have that, especially around the table, when you feel like someone's being a little bit vulnerable, it's really important to make sure that everyone's listening, that there's no teasing, that they can share their heart and be vulnerable, and that they'll be safe doing that. Um, it's important to create an atmosphere of alignment rather than rivalry. Um, we did not always have success in this because there was definitely some competition going with the boys. That's but um, I think, you know, we really tried to have each of them know that the, other, the others cared for them and um, that it was a safe place for them to be. I also know that with, um, I was watching Oprah one time and I don't know if you know, anyway, and there was someone on her show that was talking about parenting. And something she said that stuck with me was, be excited every time your child enters the room. And I know sometimes you can overdo it. But that's something that stuck with me. And I feel like, you know, when my kids come home, I walk in the door, I try to greet them right away. And then it's like, oh, how's your day? And I try to be excited that they're home and that they're back here. And I, I hope that they know that they're valued here and um, that, get, like I said, that they would feel safe. Um, sometimes after a nap, you'd go, oh, are you up already? Are you just, you didn't sleep very long. Or you can say, hey, look who's awake. And you can tell the difference in how you react. Like, yeah, you can just tell the difference. And I know late at night, especially if your kids don't keep their curfew, it's, you have a choice in that moment when they walk in that door, whether you're going to do this, you know, where were you? What were you doing? And with the tone. And, in, you know, immediately he's, the child's expecting to have the conflict, especially if you're awake. Um, or you can do, hey, how's it going? How did your evening go? And then just, pleasantly in a warm voice say what did you do who are you with what, you know what was going on and then if they did break a curfew or they broke a rule that you'd set then I think you know what you can say you know what have a good sleep and we'll talk about it in the morning and I think it's just and this is something Kent went, wanted to just someone told him one time that one of the most important things in parenting especially teenagers is don't freak out and I think that's super important because they almost expect that and I think when they come in and you're calm and you are warm, I think it's just, uh, it just reminds them that you are in relationship and you care about the relationship. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to get away with everything scot-free. There's still going to be rules and boundaries, but that you'll have those conversations maybe when you're not so tired. And I just, uh, creating a safe environment doesn't mean it's all sunshine and butterflies. Uh, it's a place to be completely vulnerable and know that you'll be loved no matter what. So engage is eyes, nearness, guide, adult, go, and environment. 
So I don't know if Kent's back on. Is Kent on? I don't know. Can you not see me? Oh, I guess on the phone. Oh yeah, you. there you are. Yeah, I, I, I look on my screen. I'm appearing and I'm back. So our internet kind of had a thing there. Thanks, Pam, for leading us through that uh, acrostic. And those are kind of principles, I guess. And it doesn't sound maybe like too glamorous as far as dazzling, but I would say that if, you, if those things were things that you were kind of working on and thinking practical ways to express those principles with wherever your kid's age is at, I think you will be a dazzling parent in the frazzling world. And um, so, yeah, so thanks for leading us through those, Pam. And I, I just want to give credit. I think it was actually Andy Stanley who talked about that not freaking out. And just the way he told it, it's kind of like, yeah, so me and my friends were at a party. And then the kid pauses and waits. And then, and then if, you, if you freak out, that's the end of the story. But they say, oh, yeah, so what, what happened? And then, and then they'll say a little bit more. So I guess that's more with teenagers. But, yeah, that idea of really being uh, open to them and how what they're saying is great. Um, so, yeah, so go ahead and feel free. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through a little section. I just sort of brainstormed some things along with Pam about just little things that we did. They're kind of, this is more of a catch-all, kind of throw everything in a basket, just some tips or tricks or ideas or things we found helpful. So you can take them or leave them. But we would also love to hear from you guys. So if you have some things that help you in your parenting – or some practical things, especially if you're doing something now with um, home learning with COVID, or if you have something that we didn't really touch on, that you're like, oh man, this would be this was really helpful for me so far in your parenting. We'd love to hear that. And maybe if you're a grandparent on here, I don't know who's actually watching, but just feel free to type in your things, and Kyle's going to mention them and put them up on text, or he'll he'll insert some of those things after. So feel free to add those things. Um, I'll just go through a couple things. I was just talking about environment. Uh, we talked about the place, safe uh, place to be. One thing that we don't regret was in our entryway, like we call it our breezeway, it goes from the front door right through our house to the back door. Kind of, it was actually built onto the in, inside the garage, so it's part of our house, but it's sort of an additional little hallway. And we actually had uh, someone build us these. Uh, we call them the cubbies, and there's four actual slots for our four kids each had almost like a locker where they could hang didn't have a door but it had all their bags could hang there and they could put all their things there their shoes could go underneath there's a place for them to sit with their school books and that's great I mean I, that's a very practical thing and you probably have something like that but if you can do some sort of a place where there's some hooks and place where they know where all the stuff goes it just keeps a bunch of the stuff out of your main house and uh shows a place where the, they can put things Another thing I did with um, sports, with um, our kids played some sports, and I tried to bring in the spiritual part of, of life and also help them to get all the stuff. So, for example, with hockey, because I can draw, I drew a little player, hockey player picture, and showed all the parts of the hockey equipment that had to be in the bag. So kids could double-check if they had all their things. It was almost like a list. But then I also put on the armor of God. So, I mean, that sounds kind of braggy. I'm a pastor. Give me a break. But if you have, a, if you have some sort of a way of tying in a spiritual theme with something practical to help them, that's just another option that you could do. Um, so, another thing uh, we, we did sometimes when we had Bible, uh, Bible verses or something like probably with Awana when our kids were in it, um, or, or sometimes we just did it on our own, I think, just to have a Bible verse for the week we would actually put it in a plastic thing and then leave it on the table so it wouldn't get all wrecked or wet if something got spilled on it. And then we would just sort of remind ourselves to, to talk about that verse or, or read it. Uh, we mentioned conversation books or devotions. Um, I'll just say one thing. Um, one of my sons actually said, I don't know, maybe a couple of them have said this. Uh, I did a father's kind of or a men's ministry thing with a couple of my boys. And one thing my son Kyle, I know for sure, said that he wished that we would have helped him a little bit more directly with learning how to have devotions on his own, like having that discipline. And it's just really hard to know what the wise thing to do is with that part of parenting. Because if you push it too hard, then they get resistant to it and it feels like you're forcing them. Um, so it's hard to know how to invite them. Even with schoolwork, I think is another expression of that. Um, we've talked to some of our kids too and they wish that we would have pushed them harder in school. But then we talked to them about it and they're like, oh yeah, you know what, we wouldn't have liked that either. So it's, I'm just admitting it's a real tough balance to know how involved or how much to help them uh, with some of those practical things like devotions or even doing their academics. Um, so yeah, and I would just say, um, maybe with uh, Pam's back on, so I'll ask her about these. There's two things. One was, um, there's, <laughs> there's a movie called Robots, and I, I, this has stuck with me, and our family's talked about this a lot. So I know it's stuck with uh, our kids from when we talked about it as well. And it's just a little line of this movie called Robots. It's a cartoon movie. Uh, and it's see a need, fill a need. 
And it's just this idea of saying, if you see something around that you could do, go ahead and do it and help out that way. And it's not a strict thing. It's actually exciting. It's almost like a game. And if you can see a need and then fill a need. So that was great. And Pam actually was, that was great that you did that. I think that's a great principle. And I think it's a great principle for adults too, but I think that's a great little parenting tidbit. And then Pam, can you explain what sprints were? That was, I think, a thing you invented, I feel, that was, uh, I felt like I was your fifth child when we got sprints going. So tell us about how sprints worked. Well, I'm not a great staff manager or organizer and stuff would pile up rather frequently, especially when there were six of us full on in the house going to and fro. So when stuff got a little out of control and I finally got, you know, I was like, okay, this is enough. Then I would say, okay, let's do sprints. And everybody would gather around wherever I was with all the stuff. And then I would pick something up and pick, we take this to the bathroom, um, take this to Kyle's room. This goes to mom and dad's room. And then they would give her, they would just run and put it where it's supposed to go. And then they'd come back and get the next thing. And it was in no time we had this like stuff cleaned up and tidy. So of course now the stuff is piled up in everybody's respective bedrooms, but the main area was kind of um, just, it was sort of a quick way to do a quick tidy. And so that was a little something that I, we did when they were smaller. Yeah, very good. Very good. That, that was a good one, sprints. Um, I also just wanted to say a couple of things. I just want to share one thing I came across with C19 with this COVID kind of restrictions. And I just want to say a big shout out of encouragement to you. If you have your kids at home, uh, preschoolers are challenging, babies are challenging, elementary school has its own challenges, teenagers they have their own challenges. And with if you have kids at home during C19 and there's these limitations and you're not wanting to you know, get together with other people all the time, uh, just, I came across this little thing. I think it was really helpful if you're, I mean, you're probably figuring this out already, so I don't want to be condescending to you, but it, I, I liked it and it's a good idea for me. And that one thing was, it was three M words. One was move so that every day you'd help your kids plan an idea of how they're going to get moving. So maybe that's inside, it's doing some sort of physical things like sprinting, like the what Pam just talked about, or you have some sort of going to the park or we're going to go for a walk or a bike ride. Or this, we have 20 minutes or an hour outside, we're going to go and do this outside. So that some, there's some sort of activity. And then the second M is make. That you'd create something. And that could be like um, making, a, feeling out a recipe or banging some nails into some wood. Or you're going to do some sort of crafts or color or create cards for someone. Just something where you're kind of putting some creativity in. And a little plug for next week um, in our parenting series we actually asked some young adults that have studied this topic of technology to talk talk about parenting and technology and this idea of making things. I think it's neat um, if you can learn some technology, uh, not just to play a game. Not that games are wrong. I don't want to say that, but uh, it's also great to learn how to maybe make and edit a movie or learn take an online course of some sort. So the idea of just kind of making something or not just the consuming content. And then the M is meat, and that's not like steak or bacon which i also love but meeting people uh, socializing and so i think sometimes kids uh, actually are okay with not getting out and seeing people some personalities right and the ones that are wanting to see people it's good to plan how can i have some socialization within safety right so maybe it is uh, going for a walk with somebody with distancing or you go and visit so you just have to use your ingenuity how to see that or maybe it is just a zoom call or facetime with grandma that you plan it so that every day you have this idea of move make and meet there were just some ideas i thought were really practical for for how to organize a day uh, or just to have some elements in there okay this is a very personal one and i know that not everyone has two parents in the home for parenting so i acknowledge that but if you do have that i know when we were there's segments of parenting where we would give each other naps, we called it. And sometimes you just need a little time, whether you sleep or not, you just need a little time where the other parent is on full blast with the kids and you give the other parent a chance to take a break. So you probably know that already, but if your kids are young, you can talk about that. And maybe the grandparents can help with that once the limits are lifted here. Um, we're gonna talk about technology next week, but I had to mention webkins, because I'm might i not sure how much I'll remember to talk about it next week. And if the, the girls that are going to do the teaching, if they take up the whole time, that'd be perfect. But uh, we have this thing called Webkins, and you get this little stuffed animal, but you also got a code, and you go on a website. And this was kind of right when the internet was kind of, not brand new, but it was, they had this little club, and they could play these mini games. Our kids were just all about it. 
uh, they wanted, so we would actually limit, I think we had 15 or 30 minute segments and then the kid would basically sign up to use the computer and if they got all their chores done and their homework, then they got the screen time as kind of a gravy or kind of a bonus. So you can adapt that as you want. We actually had a timer with it. Uh, the other thing I would say with technology is, um, I, I, I did this maybe too much, but you no, know, Pam did this sometimes too. We would talk back to the TV. Or if you see something that doesn't line up with your values and you watch it, the kids are going to see some things like that. And I just remember some movies I would say, hey, that is not right. And I would say it, then my kids would kind of groan or whatever, but that would, would do that. And there was also a time I'll mention, there was a commercial that came on during Sportsnet or with Sports Desk with uh, our kids watching. And it was very, we felt inappropriate and Pam was ready to write that email. So it's just good to watch the things your kids are watching and then feel free to talk back. You don't just have to absorb all the things that you hear. And of course, you can always turn it off. And uh, one, one story, I don't know, Pam, if you want to tell the story about the VCR on the road trip, um, but we, we sometimes would show the kids movies on the way. Like, we, were, we did that. We're, we, we're, uh, you know, we had the TV on sometimes when the kids were watching on long road trips and watching movies or whatever. There was that, well, there was that small TV VCR unit thing that we had. This is ages and ages ago. And we set it in the back of the car with the two boys. We just had two boys at that time. And we were big into Veggie Tales, and it kind of held their attention while we were on these, this long road trip. And I know at one point during the road trip, it didn't work. The TV VCR just wouldn't work. And I cried <laughs> because I realized I had relied so heavily on this technology just to make this trip bearable. And, uh, and, and I was the one who was more, I respected more than they were. So Pam's just crying because the TV's not working. Anyway, it's sort of funny. Sorry for laughing, babe, but that was pretty funny. Um, so kind of jumping around here, I want to talk about hot barf for a minute. If your kids barf in a vehicle, clean it up as quick as you can. Don't let it set. That's just a little tip for life. I'll just say that because there's a story behind that one as well. We won't get into. Uh, when, when the kids get a little bit older, uh, it's great to teach them how to do laundry. I think that's a great life skill they can they can learn. And I mentioned changing a tire or learning how to do some recipes and things and following a recipe and cooking some basic stuff. Great skills to encourage your kids. And a little tip, I only got this one, my fourth kid, I had to wait till I learned this, with learning teaching about parallel parking with Kelsey. I had a box, uh, we had a refrigerator box and we, we paced off, we had the car in front's not a bad deal, but the back one's always tricky. So I put a, I put a box where the car would be. So if, if all of a sudden you bumped it, it's no big deal, but it shows you can, you can practice parallel parking. So just a little free tip. Um, so yeah, and then the other thing I would just say would be, uh, we, this isn't, you don't have to do this, of course, but we really wanted our kids to learn a little bit of how to swim and a little bit how to skate. And those, again, you don't have to push your kids into sports if you don't want to. Oh yeah, and then we also had music. Piano, I got peace like a river in my soul. Uh, so yeah, so a little bit of music, a little bit of uh, skating, and a little bit of swimming, we did a little bit of that because we just felt like in Manitoba, kind of lake country, it would be good if you knew how to swim. So yeah, so we, that's what we did with our kids. And um, so yeah, and then some of the things Pam touched on, if you're an educator or have heard about attachment theory, uh, a lot of that stuff is just that idea. And I love this idea of collect the kid before you direct the kids. So uh, that's what sticks in my mind. So when you collect them, you're kind of going, hey, it's so great to see you. Hey, do you have a good sleep? Man, your hair is crazy today. It's good to see you. you want some breakfast? Okay, yeah, we can have breakfast, but buddy, we are super late. You know, so we have got to get going. So you can still direct them, but first you collect them and you draw them in and have that relationship kind of maintained. So if you're interested in parenting, uh, I think it's worth investing a little bit about some articles or what attachment theory is about. And teachers would know about this, but it's pretty powerful, powerful stuff. And uh, another thing I would just say, just very practical, uh, whatever age the kids are, once they're having friends, is just to meet their friends, and if you can, meet their friends' parents. And we, we really have appreciated the great people we've met uh, through that. And so, yeah, so I think that's, that's worth, worth doing. Um, and again, along with that, we love hosting birthday parties and getting the siblings involved for the other person's uh, birthdays. And when we had that, then we would also see the parents come at the door and pick up the kid. They're, you know, so we meet some of their, our kids' friends and their friends' parents. And those are just some great tips just to kind of stay con connected or stay together. And um, so, yeah. So those are some of the things I had off, off of the top of my head, just some random things kind of to add on. Um, so Pam, do you have anything else to add that comes to mind while I've been blabbing here? 
I, the, one thing, I guess the other thing that comes to mind is that don't do it alone. I think that we talked about a little bit last week. Um, don't parent alone. I know there was lots of days when I just didn't feel like I could stay home with my kids. And I bundled them up and hiked over to a friend's house. Uh, often that had kids the same age. And then they went and played and I could get um, my bearings again. And, and now with COVID, it, I can't even imagine how hard it would be to know that you can't do that. And um, you, there's a lot of brave parents out there who are getting through this time because I know I, I relied fairly heavily on my close friends at that time who um, would let me just come and be at their place with my kids and they were always very gracious. And so they are, were a huge influence on my kids as well. So don't try not to do it alone, especially with COVID now, I'm not sure how you can not do it alone, but um, yeah, it's tough. Yeah, I would just pick up with that too, that again, we, we've dumped a lot of content and it, sound, it could sound like we're telling you this, do this, and do this, and do this. And you might think, oh, this is never gonna work. We're, we're just trying to share things that we hope would be encouraging for you to think about and try. And I echo what Pam's saying. If you're discouraged today or you know someone that's discouraged, that is normal. I know it doesn't feel great, but there's lots of times where you just don't know for sure what to do. And, and just to be honest about that and get the support and help you need. And don't go through it alone. Reach out. And you can contact the church if you need someone to talk to. We'd, we'd love that uh, to have you just go on the website and you can fill up the contact form of what you need or, or whatever. And I'll have to pray for you in just a minute to kind of maybe close off this part. And then um, we'll ask Kyle if there's any kind of questions that have come up. And not so much even questions, but if you have any tips, there's still some people in the room here who are listening to this. Just go ahead and text out some things that you found helpful because the most important thing might be what you want to share with everybody. That might be helpful for someone else listening or, or for us. So while you're thinking about that, I'm going to pray in just a minute. I want to show you just a book quickly. Uh, this is uh, called Words Kids Need to Hear. It's written by David Stahl. It's got two A's in it. And actually, my friend, Pastor Rob, actually gave me this copy. And um, what's cool about it is it just, it's, it has a, a few really key things, and then it writes about why they're important. And I just want to read them. And I think maybe I'll close off this part, and, and Kyle's typing that in there. You can see it there. But it's, here's, the, here's the things, the little sentences. I believe in you. You can count on me. I treasure you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Because no... I love you. And then that that would be received and believed by your kids. And so I know there's just encouragement about our words, uh, watching our tone, being careful. I told you last week, if you're watching, I, I have to really wrestle with my angry voice and kind of being intense sometimes. And so, yeah, there's lots of room for asking God to forgive us and asking our kids to forgive us and say, I'm sorry, dad was wrong. I didn't do that right, and can we please forgive me? And you can start over each day with uh, energy and strength God provides. So um, I'd like just to, to uh, pray, and then if there's some, I'll come back and we'll invite Kyle back in the room, and then if there's some other uh, comments or questions, we'd love to hear from you if there's some, some things, and we'll, maybe we'll make comments on it or just see if, what Kyle says when he comes back on. Let me pray for us, and then um, we'll have Kyle back. Father, I just want to thank you for this time we've been able to spend just thinking about principles and things that would be wise for us to keep working on as parents. Lord, we just acknowledge that it's tough to, um, in, the, in the heat of parenting, to know exactly what the right thing to do is all the time. And I'm so thankful that you give us grace and, and help and that kids are resilient. But I pray that you would help us all to keep growing in our parenting, that we would, just before you ask you to help us with this and... We know that there's lots of lofty ideas and goals, but even just to have some practical things that we can keep thinking about and working on. And I just pray that there might be one or two things that each of us can keep growing in that you'd help us with it. Lord, for the people that are feeling discouraged or under pressure or feeling lonely, I just pray that you'd comfort them and give them strength tonight, even as we're taking this time to uh, spend together. So we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right, I think that's all we have, Kyle, as far as our content. Uh, is there some, some tips or questions, or is there tips that people have you want to share with us? Um, oh, I'm seeing something in the Q&A now. Um, so, yes, just a reminder, now is a good time. If you uh, have questions or if you have thoughts, uh, you can use either the Q&A feature or the chat feature um, to interact. Um, so this is the first uh, question. 
and um, it isn't asked anonymously, so I'll just use the name. So this one's from Alyssa. Any encouragement, tips, or tricks that helps get a child's eyes when they do not want to listen? So I know, Pam, you talked about the eyes. So do you want to address that a little bit? I, the only thing that comes to mind is to get into their space. So if they're playing with toys and they refuse to look at you, I'd sit right down and put your face in their face and just make sure that you're getting their eyes. So I guess I, the thing that comes to mind is just getting into their space and, and being really intentional and honest that that's what your expectation is. I don't know. What do you think, Kent? Um, yeah, I didn't catch all that. It went a little blurry there for me. But um, yeah, and again, when, I think when Pam is saying that, she's not saying to be aggressive, obviously, but just that you'd be willing no. to go down to where they are and try to find them. And sometimes when you're in, you know, if the kid's really against or pushing away or hiding under a blanket or kind of, kind of belligerent, that's, that's not the, you know, you still obviously want to get it. But um, I, I think it takes time. Honestly, it just takes time. And if you, actually, like Pam said, if you actually stop, not, if you don't talk until they're actually looking, and wait, they are curious to see what your reaction is. And so, yeah, but it is, it's not an easy thing to get them if they're not in a great mood or they're not cooperating with you. It's just something you have to kind of train a little bit over time. And sometimes you can kind of get around them and say, hey, I see you. It's like, and then you can try to talk to them and hopefully you can kind of engage them and keep it. I try to keep it light. That was probably my default was to try to distract the kid and keep it light. And Pam would be more like direct, like, okay, like you're gonna look at me, we're gonna talk this over. Is that fair to say, Pam? I don't know if that's right or not, but. And I do think there is some value in making sure that there is, that you're not going anywhere, that your kid knows you're not leaving the situation, you're not leaving the conversation, and, and you're not just going to drop it because they're hiding. So I think it's important to follow through. You know, if you are asking them to do something or have an expectation, I think it is important to, to stick it out, even if it does take time or you have to wait for them to, to come around. But I, I think if you don't follow through, then they get used to the idea that if I hide or, or don't participate long enough, then I won't have to do that. So it's, I think it's important if you have an expectation to follow through with it. But it is hard when they don't want to give it to you. Awesome. Yeah, challenging, challenging question though, it's good. Well, that is the only question that has come through. So I um, think we're gonna call it there then, unless another one pops up right away. So I'll just make a few quick uh, announcements before you guys all head out. Um, just a reminder that um, tomorrow we're going to have Tom Peters on uh, for the next session at 7 o'clock tomorrow. And he's going to lead us through um, the topic of counseling and how it relates to our growth as Christians. So that one's going to be very interesting. Um, and then next week, um, Pastor Scott's going to be taking over the leadership track. Um, and he'll be talking about situational leadership and how it can be important to adapt your leadership style to fit different situations. Um, on Wednesday, then I believe Kent and Pam will be back and Kent already touched on this a bit, but they'll be talking about technology and smartphones and how that um, is affecting family life and that sort of thing. And then uh, next week, Thursday, Paul Gallasier is going to be talking about homosexuality in the church. Um, so we've got, and then we've got a whole nother week after that yet. So we've got, um, we're only in week two of four weeks. So um, yeah, feel free to invite friends, invite family. Uh, take adv advantage of some of these awesome teaching times. Um, we've got lots of wise people um, like Kent and Pam um, offering us nuggets, offering us gold, right? So um, <laughs> appreciate that you're here and have a great night. Thanks, Kyle. All right. <laughs>